stories of human love as a metaphor for the divine is something that is a remarkable part of Indian aesthetics. In the West, this was something that disappeared maybe two millennium ago. There, there's quite a distinction between sacred and profane love. Except for Song of Solomon in the Bible and Ecstasy of Teresa. In particular, the Git Govinda by Jayadev was mystical poetry that really made Radha, the particular gopi, who had been mentioned in earlier uh, Puranas and things, but mostly one looked at gopis in general. Now, Radha in the Git Govinda is a very remarkable character because she has all merits. She is a very highly evolved person, and we would call her an Uttmanayaka in her responses. And yet the story of her yearning for love and connection with Krishna is the metaphor for the uh, Jivatma connecting to the Paramatma. Now, Git Govind is very profound, and there has been much written on it. It can um, be looked at from many different perspectives. So today, I just want to take a few drops from the ocean and share about why this story is really significant for all of us. It's not only the bliss of bhakti. It's not only that we would all love to be dancing with the Lord. But the idea that Radha is not a generic sakhi. She is unique and special in the same way that we all are, at least apparently. But ultimately, you have to embrace the unselfishness, the idea of non-duality, the idea that you cannot singularly, selfishly have the ultimate reality unless you accept that you have to share it with everyone. Now, it's very often uh, said nowadays, it's like, oh my goodness, this is so retrograde, all this Radha Krishna stuff. What girl should be waiting and pining and moaning? Uh, that's not the way things are now. That is 100% true when you're talking on a human level. But when you're using this as a metaphor for something uh, that you're taking human experience, it's quite different. So nobody should put up with things from a human beloved uh, unless you're sure that they're actually Krishna. So in the beginning of Git Govind, it's framed that Radha is asked to take Krishna through the forest. Now, there are many ways this is interpreted. Sometimes it shows that she is the one that is actually doing this all. Sometimes it's seen that it's just in her imagination, like a flash, as she touched his hand and the whole Ras Leela appeared. Sometimes it's said that it was not Nanda, it was actually Radha who said this, or Krishna or others. But the fact is, we have this story, and what's very important is that it's framed by the opening song, which is about Dashavatar. So it's framing Krishna as an incarnation of Vishnu, preserver of the universe. So with that context, we begin the story of this Leela. Now, this Sringar Ras is very, frankly, erotic. And it goes to such a depth that it really evokes a great deal of emotion with the aim that one will appreciate that this depth of emotion, this depth of passion, this depth of yearning is something that has to be realized as something that can take us out of samsaric life and into something that is ultimately of greater value. When Jayadev wrote this in the um, 
uh, 1100s, late 1100s, only these songs were sung in Jagannath Puri. They were danced and sung up till the time that the British passed the Anti-Notch Act and forbade uh, dance and singing in temples. It spread by the 13th century to Western India, then soon across North India. Chaitanya was enamored of it, so it became a very uh, strong part of that Vaishnav, Vaishnav movement. So what I'd like to do now, since I am a dancer, Odissi, is to recreate and give you a flavor of some of the ras that's in this. So first of all, we have to set up that we are in the springtime. And here we are. So first of all, you create the atmosphere. Now springtime is not only the season of love, but it is also our lives. We are temporarily in the springtime. So you've got beautiful flowers, which are as beautiful as the girls. You've got bees buzzing. You've got cuckoos that are flying. You've got clove creepers that are embracing the trees like a beloved. You've got the winds, the sandalwood winds coming from Malaysia because we're in Odisha, which is right across from Southeast Asia where they traveled regularly. And in this beautiful springtime, everyone, everyone wants to be dancing with their Krishna. And this includes everyone in the sense that male and female, we are all the uh, female for Krishna. Now, actually the thorns of pain of the separation, when Krishna is very far, your Krishna, the Krishna is far, is something that's very painful. Not painful like forever painful, but painful in separation. Most of the Gita Govinda and most of the idea is about separation and these different stages, misunderstandings of that separation. And so you have to be going through with that goal in mind. So actually, the coming together, the culmination, the unity, is something that happens only really at the very end. In this springtime, of course, we are, everyone is dancing and playing holy. And in the representation, which everyone has experienced, the idea of playing color, that uh, Krishna throws it at, at Radha. She puts chandan paste on him. He flicks it at her. She throws color. He grabs her cloth, embraces her. Now, some of this love play in today's world, we look at it and we say, is that Eve teasing? <laughs> or is this the kind of flirtation um, of willing, cooperating partners? So in the dance, in the poetry, we can only reflect the cultural expressions that we all share. And so some of the images today can be misused, misread. But I think that clearly when Krishna pulls her cloth and loosens things, uh, it's understood in a context that's not abusive, definitely. So again, everyone is playing, everyone is dancing. Uh, Everyone is having a wonderful time dancing with Krishna, except if your beloved is far, then you're going to be very sad, you're going to be pining. Okay, that, that is simply generically setting up the mood. Then we come to the end of each of the Ashtapadis, the eight stanzas poetries. Every one of them is going to bring you back from whatever the love play has been, the separation, the pain, the happiness, to the point. So that you will be saying, remember, all of those thorns, all of that pain will be dispelled when you go to the feet of Hadi. And he's the one 
who will relieve all of your suffering. Just think, meditate on Hari. Radha then in Gita Govinda is telling her Saki, she's saying, Saki, please, I want you to go and bring to me that Lord. Which one? The one who has destroyed Kaysen. Kaysen was a demon. He was a horse with long hair. So he has slain me in the same way. My heart is filled with the desire to be with him. And then she says, I remember so many incidences. And so she tells her of these different times they'd been together. Now, everyone, I think, is familiar with the idea of the Abhisaraka Nayaka, the girl, the heroine, who's going to meet him. So in the one thing that's interesting is that, first of all, it's nighttime. She wants to go to meet, to meet Krishna. She's feeling shy. Radha has to leave her house where her mother-in-law and the woman by marriage, sister-in-law, are sleeping. Radha is parikya. That means that she is married, as the other gopis are, most of them, and they are therefore taking even more risk by going off to follow the flute when they hear it from Krishna. Again, not something recommended on the human level, but the idea of the abandoning one's lajja, one's modesty, because you are so desperate and desirous of that union with the divine. So when we have the Abhisaraka, of course we recognize that you have the, the beautiful moonlight, but as Radha goes, there's going to be snakes, there's going to be thorns, there's going to be the fear that when you catch your cloth that somebody is there. Um, uh, you're going through the night, sometimes stumbling. But finally, when, when Radha uh, is seen by Krishna in the beautiful bower, then she feels shy, she laughs, etc. So she remembers all of these things. She tells her Saki, the first time that our eyes met, what could I do? He pulled my cloth, and I just felt love for him. So it goes on and on. And in fact, the, uh, one, of the last, one of the last stanzas um, is very clear that when she's remembering when they had made love before, that her anklets, all of her anklets, they had wrung out when they were together, that her, um, her girdle, the bells here had also been loosened, and that when he pulled her hair and gave her kisses, then she was so much filled with, with the love uh, and fulfilled the desire. But then again, all of the time, we are brought back to the fact that who is this beloved? This is Jagannath. This is Krishna. This is Vishnu. So this is, again, you've created all of this mood. Now the story, because life is not easy, uh, and there are challenges. So the challenge for Radha, and this is the crux of the way I look at Git Govinda, is that what holds her back from here on is the fact that she is jealous. She has envy for the fact that he is with others. And as everyone knows, in the Ras Lila, when Krishna appears, everyone wants to dance with him. And so he, um, um, uh, he makes himself available to everyone. But Radha is not happy that he is with the others. And this is what creates the problem. So in, um, in, uh, as the Gita Govinda continues, Krishna is sitting in the bower. He sends the girlfriend to Saki and says, 
um, the, the, on the beautiful banks of the river. Again, the Malay, Malay winds, and I'm waiting. And she tells, the Saki tells, when he hears um, a leaf fall or a feather, he thinks it's you. Please hurry. Go to him. Don't let your hips delay you. His flute is calling your name. But the problem is that Radha is pained thinking about the time he's spending with others. And so she doesn't want to go there. She wants him to come where she is. And she is now waiting and actually becoming almost mad. She sees him everywhere. Um, when she, uh, when she, she thinks she sees him, but actually it's a leaf on a tree. She imagines him everywhere. She's stumbling, going to meet him, and so much anxiety. She tries to take uh, his favorite, the lotus stem, which is supposed to be cooling, and to protect herself from the, from the, from the heat, but nothing works. In fact, when she puts on chandan paste, which is supposed to be cooling, she discovers that even the moon's rays are burning this, and she has to take it off. So she's quite miserable in separation, and Vasaka Saja. These are the classic poses from Kunar Temple. Here I'm climbing on a lintel in order to have a blue screen for a documentary so that they could superimpose it on those. And these are all of this waiting, waiting, waiting. Again, modern girls should not spend their time waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, it's fine. But in this case, for Radha, it's very appropriate. Now comes what my daughter used to call the sad dance. Yahi Madhava. So she's waiting. He shows up. It's, it's 4 in the morning. She sees that the moon has changed position. 4 o'clock has come, no Krishna. And when he shows up, she sees that his peacock feather's fallen. In its place is a woman's earring dangling. And then she sees that around his hips is a woman's cloth. Now, because she's an Uttama Nayaka, instead of taking out the rolling pin, instead she thinks, Acha, I see, he's been awake all night. He's been feeling passion for another. She says, Yahi Madhava, don't come to me. Don't speak your lies. Go to that one. She's the one who will relieve all of your suffering. And then she accuses him. She says, I can see kajal from her lips on you. You're black up and down. Everything about you is black, inside and out. He says, no, I was picking berries. My lips are stained. She says, I see scratches on your chest. He says, no, you see, for you, uh, I went into the forest uh, to pick a flower for your hair. And then when I reached for that special flower, the thorns. She says, how can you do this? How can you talk like this? She said, you, you are God. You are divine. Everything about you. And yet, you went to that one, and you left me waiting, and now everything is faded. Everything is finished. The lamp, which was like the light of my life, is gone. And she says, that's it. Cut down. Jao. Well, she doesn't say Jao. She's Uttama Naika. Jaye. <laughs> OK. So now we come again to the real, the turning point. This is quite fascinating. When poet Jayadev had to write that Krishna said, put your foot on my head, I'm sorry, he couldn't do it. So he went to take a bath. While he took a bath, apparently Vishnu, Krishna himself, appeared in his form 
sat down and wrote these lines, and then went to his house and ate lunch, which Jadib discovered all of this when he came from his bath, and his wife said, but you just finished eating, and then discovered that it was already written, because he couldn't bring himself to write this. Now, this is the crux. When Krishna says this, put your feet soft as tender leaves on my head, leave your pride aside, she does. When she gives up her ego, her self-cherishing, then they come to the fulfillment. And when she says, oh, Yadunandana, please, I want you to, um, again, after they've made love, do all of these things. Um, um, with your hands cooler than sandal, apply the musk and the designs. Fix my hair again, put the curls, the kajal, which was thick as a beeline, is gone. And all of these things, though, in the end, she says, thank you for allowing me to express this emotion to you. And so, to sum it up, the bliss that is shared uh, in this bhakti, in this Sringar bhakti, in this watching this Radha, uh, Radha and Krishna, it's not only that it's beautiful. It's not just all, you know, Amrachitrakata stories. It's not just, isn't it lovely? Um, it's the idea that if you want to achieve real happiness, moksha, you must give up your self-centered, self-cherishing feelings of duality. And when you give that up, not in weakness but in confidence, then you will achieve real bliss. Thank you.